Morning, church. Thank you so much for spending your Sunday morning to worship our Lord here with us. My name is Hanley. If you're new, I'm one of the pastors here, and it's a joy to be part of this team. Last Sunday, we were at retreat, and over the weekend, Pastor Albert challenged us by setting forth a strategic roadmap. It's not a plan, meaning what he shared with us. There aren't any deadlines of of how long it'll take to get this plan done. But instead, there were a lot of options, ministry options, ministry opportunities that will require each of us in this church to step up and play a different role. A lot of the things that we put forth, the pastors don't even know how to do some of these projects, such as community outreach or different things that were proposed. Uh, Instead, we put those out just to see if God has put any of you, put it on any of your hearts with both gifting and experience and desire to say, hey, I, I want to pray about it. Um, I want to take this up and, and I want to lead it. I want to be part of a team uh, that moves us towards accomplishing this piece of our vision. So in the weeks to come, you'll see this unfold a little more. I was talking with, I was talking with Pastor Albert on Friday in regard to how we're going to treat this particular passage. One of the things that's key to our vision is that we want to be driven by a passion for God's word. And we want to be biblical, which means we want to preach every single passage in this sacred desk by treating it in its context. And a lot of times it's hard to jump from a passage that already has an intent and it's somehow tie it to our strategy or our vision. And so what we're going to do is we're going to wrap up Acts in two weeks. Not all of Acts, but I'm going to finish up chapter 10 today. Next week, Pastor Matt is going to do all of chapter 11, and we're going to stop there. Uh, Chapter 11 and 10, 10 and 11 is a turning point in redemptive history where the Gentiles receive salvation, and we we figure that that's a nice place to stop. Then in the final week of August, I'll come back, uh, and I'll lead us just a little bit in beginning to see how the English congregation can take the first few steps towards achieving our strategy and our vision. Then in all of September, Pastor Albert will be leading us in preaching and unpacking that further. So today we're just going to focus on the passage, uh, and we'll come back to apply our retreat uh, in the weeks to come. But we love you more than you know because you are the body of Christ. This is one body, uh, and, and each of us needs to play our part as members of the body in order for us to move forward. Uh, one of the tangible ways that you can help, we need help today. Uh, we came back from retreat. We're trying to uh, you know, we're trying to catch up with everything, and 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 something that that just came onto our plate this week is that we need help this afternoon with cleaning up after lunch. It just happened to be uh, the English congregation's turn, uh, so we have enough helpers who have volunteered to help serve the food. But if you can avail yourself uh, from 12:30 to about 1:30 today, we need especially men. Uh, we need men to help break down tables and chairs, and we need men to help wash dishes. Uh, and, and most of us men, if, if you don't like to cook at home, you know that we wash dishes. Uh, I have to teach a class during that time, otherwise I'd be there in there with you. But we have some big pots and pans, and so if there's any men that could just help us out. Look, it's not football season, there's no game on. Um, so if you can come uh, to the kitchen or go to the courtyard around 1230 and just say, hey, I'm just here to help, um, and, and the more the merrier, and you can get that done fast. Uh, and so uh, we need help baptizing some of those dishes. So please do come out uh, and help us in that way. But let's just jump right into our passage now. So I'm going to make a little bit of a transition. You know, I don't think any of us, if you're a professing Christian, I don't think any of us would deny that everybody needs Jesus. Everyone needs Jesus. Good people need Jesus. Bad people need Jesus. People in the middle need Jesus. Rich people need Jesus. Poor people need Jesus. Middle class people need Jesus. Athletic people need Jesus. Short people need Jesus. Tall people need Jesus. Everyone needs Jesus. But I think that it's natural for us to feel like, oh, that guy's bad. He's a criminal. He really needs Jesus. Saul, who became the Apostle Paul, he needed Jesus. I mean, everybody knew that. Every Jewish Christian understood that, that this guy wants to kill Christians. He's a murderer. He's a terrorist. He's 
he's preaching against our Lord, he really needs to get saved. The thief on the cross, no one would deny that this robber, this criminal needed Jesus. And I think sometimes it's like that for us. You know, when, when, when we think of bad people, we think that they need Jesus. I know for a fact, and I think it's okay because, you know, God has payback and it's fair because uh, I got called into ministry. It's a blessing. But I know for a fact that all of my Sunday school teachers growing up said Hanley needs Jesus. Uh, it wasn't hard for me uh, to realize that I wasn't, I didn't see myself as a decent person growing up. Uh, in junior high and high school, I knew that there was something wrong. I knew that I was bad. I saw myself as a dirty pagan. I knew that. And I, 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 I knew that there was something worse about me is that I wasn't someone who never learned about the Bible. In fact, I went to church and got kicked out of Bible drill. So I knew about the Bible. I heard these story, stories and I would make fun of people like Noah. You know, I would make fun of uh, Christians in that time. So I knew I was bad. The question was, do I want to commit my life to this man named Jesus, because he's going to change my life. Obviously, at that point, I was wrestling with whether or not Jesus is God and whether or not I want to live for God. <clears throat> so I understood <clears throat> that I needed the gospel. The question is, do I want to respond to the gospel? But in today's passage, we're going to see something different. We're going to see two major themes. First, we're going to see the morally upright people, people who you would naturally think, oh, that person's not that bad. Maybe that's how you view yourself, that good people need Jesus too. In fact, sometimes they need Jesus more than those who we think were bad because good people don't think they're bad. You know, it's just, it's just, what it, it, it's just how it is. And second, we're going to see the point of the text, which is here in Acts chapter 10 is a turning point in redemptive history. In God's plan, to save sinners and redeem them unto himself, which we see unfolded from Genesis 3.15, where God promises that a child born from the woman Eve, meaning a human being, will defeat and crush the head of the serpent and defeat Satan and redeem fallen creation. That that thing plays out, and in the Old Testament, God had, in a temporary moment, had turned his, the, the foci of his redemption on Israel, on Abraham's descendants. And, and it was that way for 39 books of the Bible. And then all of a sudden, enter the New Testament and the church. And all of a sudden, God wants to save Gentiles. And we learn today that he always wanted to save Gentiles. In fact, it was never about Israel. It was always about Abraham. You're the forefather of Israel. I'm going to promise you, Abraham, a couple of things. One, your wife is barren, but I'm going to show you that I, I'm going to work in you. I'm going to give you children. One, I'm going to give you a seed, and you're going to have many descendants. I'm going to make you a great nation. Secondly, in order for you to be a nation, you need land. You need entity. You need somewhere to be a nation. I'm going to give you the land of Canaan. And thirdly, and most importantly, through your descendants, who later, you know, there's Isaac, and then Jacob, and Jacob's going to have 12 sons, and those 12 sons will become the great nation of Israel. And through your descendants, Abraham, I'm going to bring blessing to who? Just Israel? All the families of the earth. That's always God's plan. That was God's plan from the beginning, from Genesis 12, that he wanted to save the nations. And what we're going to see today is that it, gets fulfilled. All right, so let's take God's word and turn with me to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. And we're going to see God's redemptive plan unfold and basically be executed and implemented here in Acts chapter 10 with a conversion of a Gentile. Acts chapter 10. And last time we were together, we looked at verses 1 to 33. So I'm going to give you a quick summary of verses 1 to 33, then we're going to pick up in verse 34 and begin our message, okay? But Acts chapter 10, quick summary. Last time we were together, God was preparing two people for Gentile salvation. The first person we saw was that, was that he was 
preparing a man named Cornelius. Now, Cornelius, God could have visited Cornelius himself and said, Cornelius, my name is Jesus. I'm the cornerstone. And Cornelius, you're going to turn to the cornerstone. Okay, you're going to turn to me today. But he didn't do that. Instead, he gives them a vision and he tells Cornelius, I want you to summon a man named Peter and go get him and tell him to come and he's going to share with you good news that you need to hear. So Cornelius receives that vision. He obeys and he goes, he sends out messengers to summon Peter. Now there's something unique about Peter because Peter is a Jewish Christian. Cornelius was a God-fearing non-Jew. And anybody who's not Jewish by blood, we call them Gentiles. Most of us are Gentiles in here, I would assume. Okay? We are Gentiles. Right? We're not gentle. Some, we should be gentle, but we are Gentiles. Okay? Um, and, and so Cornelius, he's not a pagan Gentile, though. Meaning, he wasn't someone who was known for sexual immorality or false religion. There was something unique about this Gentile. Even though he wasn't a Jew, he worshipped the Jewish God. He prayed to God daily, not only him, but he and his family. And he was known for good works, charity. And the the text told us, and we saw that two weeks ago, that he was well respected among the Jewish people. The Jewish people respected him. And he was a military leader, meaning he was a man of honor. He was a man of rank. He was a key leader well-respected by both Jews and Romans. And it says that he was Italian. And so that's a little bit of background. And God was preparing this guy. And so Cornelius would be who you and I would see as he's a pretty good person. Heck, he's halfway there. He doesn't believe in Jesus, but he kind of believes in Jesus' daddy. Doesn't that mean anything? He believes in God the Father. He believes in Yahweh. Isn't that pretty good? I mean, he doesn't worship Buddha. He doesn't worship uh, the Hindu religion. At least he believes in the right father. If he believes in a third of the Trinity, he should go to heaven. You know, that, that's what a lot of people would think. But he's an example of a morally righteous, good person who kind of got a third of the Trinity right. And what we see in today's passage is, uh, it's not good enough. He needs to hear the gospel. But who's going to bring him the gospel? That's where we see redemptive history happening, is that God had been focusing on the Jews. And now he tells a Jewish Christian leader, Peter. And so first he prepares Cornelius. Now he prepares, we saw that he prepares. Secondly, he prepared Peter. And he gave Peter this wild vision. And this vision entailed Peter seeing all the animals of the earth. And the point of that vision was, Peter, you're going to rise, kill, and eat, meaning you can eat these foods. Now, there's something you have to know about these foods if you weren't here two weeks ago. Is that in the Old Testament, there were strict dietary laws, and this wasn't just for health. These laws were meant to set the Jewish people apart from the rest of the world, meaning there's certain foods that God declares unclean. And what he means by that is not that you can't wash the food. Okay, What God meant by that is that if you eat these foods, you become spiritually declared unclean and, and viewed as unclean in the eyes of God. But the Gentiles ate all kinds of food. You know, pork, shrimp, all the stuff we like, you know, uh, certain types of seafood that we enjoy. But Jewish people had a strict diet. And these dietary stri- restrictions, it wasn't really about the food. It was about fellowship. God wanted to set his people apart. He knew that if if Israel intermingled with the nations, they would become polluted and they would follow the idols of the nations. And as you can see from the Old Testament, that's what happened anyways, even though God had these rules. So God just wanted to put a fence there. Israel, 90% of the time, jumped over that fence anyway. Okay, so the whole point wasn't about food. The whole point was God saying, I don't want you, Israel, at this point, because I can't change your hearts yet, because I haven't sent Jesus yet, I can't change your hearts. Your hearts are sinful, Israel. So I I need you to be separated from the rest of the Gentile nations. Because once you start intermarrying and mingling, guess what? You're going to worship their gods. Case in point, Solomon. Right? So Israel failed over and over falling into idolatry. But one of the ways to keep them separate 
is that you guys aren't going to be friends. Jews and Gentiles aren't going to be homies. You're not going to sit together. You're not going to eat together. And how am I going to do that? You're not going to eat their food. You're going to be disgusted by their food, Jews. And so even if I bring, if you're eating with a Gentile and you're a Jew in the Old Testament, and I bring out barbecue pork ribs, you're just like, oh, that's gross. That's gross. I'm stumbling. Get Lucille's away from me. All right, you're not really feeling any Phil's barbecue. But um, the point really wasn't about food. It was about fellowship. And I want you to understand that. That what Jesus is doing here in Acts is he's breaking down the barriers by telling uh, Peter, you're going to go and you're going to share. And he's saying, I want Jews and Gentiles to have table fellowship. It's not just about food. It's about relationship. Now you can eat together. Now you can be friends. Now you can do something that you would have never done before. And that's where we pick up today. So look with me now at verse 34, where we see our first point. A God-fearing Gentile. This is a good guy with his friends and family. It's not a mobile plan. But they hear the gospel. A God-fearing Gentile hears the gospel. Key word hears because he needed to hear the gospel. I'm going to expand on this. Look at verse 34. Look at what it says. Acts 10, verse 34. I'm going to read this to you. Follow along with your eyes and your heart. So Peter opened his mouth. Well, duh. Why do you got to tell us that? I'm going to explain it. Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality. Meaning God shows no favoritism towards just the Jews. Verse 35. But in every nation, anyone who fears him, and does what is right is acceptable to him. Stop right there for a second. Peter opened his mouth. That's kind of funny. I mean, most of the time when you read in the New Testament, it's just he said, he responded, Jesus said, Jesus declared. Right? But why does it have to make this point that before he speaks, he opens his mouth? Luke makes this funny mention right here in Acts. But this expression in the Greek is important. Because in Greek culture, or in the Greek language, this construction, if you say he opened his mouth, then he spoke, it tells you that what he's about to say is critically important. And why he needs to open his mouth and proclaim, because this is an announcement that the God of Israel wants to save the Gentiles. That the God of Israel wants to save the Gentiles, and it is... Israel's Messiah that saves the Gentiles. So this is a turning point that we mentioned. Look at verse 34 and 35 again. Peter says, Truly I say that God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. In other words, God doesn't show favoritism towards the Jews. But wait a minute. Wait a minute. Isn't 39 books of our Bible focused on Israel? That's why I gave you the introduction that I gave you. Yes. A bulk of your Bible is about Israel and the Jews. But Israel missed the point. They missed the point of the promise that I mentioned to you in the beginning. Israel, their entire identity, do you understand that their entire identity is wrapped up around Abraham and the promises to Abraham, why do you think that they care so much that they're still fighting about that piece of Palestinian land today? Because their entire being, their race, is tied to Abraham. That's our forefather. And God promised him that we would be a great nation, Israel. And so, and, and God told Abraham that we would be special. And we came out of supernatural miracle because Sarah was barren. And God promised us this land. And the Muslims can't have it. Hamas can't have it. No mas. Can't have it. It was promised to our forefather. Just a piece of land. It was meant to point towards the new creation. But, but they're still fighting over it. And, they fail to realize the most important part of that blessing, which is, look, seed is seed. Descendant, ancestry is ancestry. Land is land. All of that's going to fade one day. But what's the most important part of the Abrahamic promise? Salvation for you and me. 
salvation for the nations, redemption. That's what they fail to for, they fail to remember. And so, did God show favoritism? No. Did He focus on Israel? Yes. But did He show favoritism? No, because to Abraham, Israel's forefather, it was always about the nations, and Israel was supposed to be a light to the nations. And every time they fail, God put them into exile. Every time Israel failed and they forgot about their purpose and they were supposed to be a light to the nations, not become mixed in with the sins and the idolatry of the nation. And whenever they failed to be a light and that light went out, God punished them. And so when Jesus came onto the scene, what, did, what does John 1 tell us? Right, he comes, the word become flesh, and he comes, light into darkness. First John 1 as well. Jesus comes to represent the true Israelite and where Israel failed. Jesus Christ comes and says, Israel failed, but I am the son that comes out of Israel. I am the seed of Abraham, Galatians 3. I am that descendant of Abraham that's going to bring blessing to the nations. Does that make sense? Okay, so did God show favoritism? Kind of, not really. He's always had a heart for the nations. And that's the meaning of what Peter's saying. He says, truly I say that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right God is acceptable to him. And God wants to save Cornelius, case in point. Cornelius was a person who feared God, who was righteous, who does what is acceptable to him, but salvation is not by works, meaning Cornelius' worship of God the Father and Cornelius' conversion to Judaism and Cornelius' good works aren't going to save him. He needs more. He needs to hear something from a Jewish Christian who's going to come. And he needs to hear the gospel. To do what is right again means to obey God's commands. And we know that no human being can perfectly obey God's commands. That's why to do what is right requires trusting in Jesus Christ, which we see in verse 36. Look at verse 36. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ. What's the good news? The good news is you can have peace with God now through faith in Jesus Christ. And it says he is Lord of all. There's a parenthetical note. And that's, that's saying he's not just the Lord of Israel. He's the Messiah of Israel and the nations. He is the Lord of all. Notice that Peter alludes to the good news that was preached to the people of Israel and that there's peace with God through Jesus Christ. In other words, right, as for the word that he sent to Israel, meaning it, the gospel and the Messiah went to Israel first. And the gospel and Jesus still goes out to Israel, even though they rejected their Messiah. Now, in verse 30, starting in verse 37, we begin to see the content of the gospel. So he's going to share the gospel now, the good news of Jesus Christ. What is the gospel? Here we see Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. That is the key essential components. Those are the key essential components of the good news. He begins with Jesus' life. Jesus was not just a man. Right? He, was the, he is the risen Lord, but he begins with the life. Now look at verse 37. You yourselves know, which means that Cornelius and his family had heard about Jesus, this man named Jesus. Do you yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after baptism that John proclaimed? So John baptized Jesus and began to proclaim Jesus. And then verse 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. You yourselves know. Remember, how does he know? Cornelius worshipped the God of Israel. And he heard what the Jews heard. And he also understood a, a little bit of the Old Testament. Now, the way that Peter talks about the life of Christ, there's fulfillment language. And I want you to see this. The way that he shares the gospel is Jew-friendly. If you're a Jewish person, you grew up looking forward and anticipating this Savior, this Messiah that's going to save you, that's going to rescue you. And, and, and dear to your heart is the book of Isaiah. I, you, you love Isaiah because Isaiah talks about God's 
Davidic king, the future Davidic king that's going to come. Isaiah prophesies and foreshadows the suffering servant who's going to come and redeem God's people because they could not bear their own reproach and there will be one who bears their sins. And Isaiah 11, 2 foreshadows the Davidic king. And Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, it, it, it predicts this, this future son of David where it describes the spirit of the Lord will descend upon him. Now I want you to keep a finger in your Bibles here in, Isaiah, uh, in Acts 10. And I want you to flip with me. So keep a finger here like this. And I want you to flip with me to Isaiah 61. And yeah, when I say that, I'm assuming that most of you have paper Bibles. I know I'm going against the trend, but it's much easier to study God's Word when you can flip it. And you don't have to wait for your Wi-Fi um, or your you know wireless to, to catch up with you. Wi-Fi is slow on Sunday, by the way, because everybody's on it. Okay, So I suggest that on Sundays, you either use your data or bring a Bible. All right. So Isaiah 61. Look at Isaiah 61, verses 1 to 2. And if you're a Jew, compare this. I'm not saying you're a Jew, but if you are Jewish, you can compare this to what Peter says to Cornelius and have some understanding. Look at Isaiah 61. Look at verses 1 and 2. It reflects Acts 10, 38. It says, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Now, this is foreshadowing the Messiah. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. To do what? What what has the Lord appointed you to do? To bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to repair broken souls, to proclaim liberty to the captives. What are these captives? People who are possibly demon-possessed, under the slavery of sin. An opening of the prison to those who are bound. This is spiritual bondage. Verse 2, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. You see that language? Now go back to Acts 10. Go back to Acts 10 and let me show you verse 37, 38 again. You yourselves know what happened through all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed, the word anointed, that's in Isaiah 61, anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit. Isaiah 61, 1, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And with power, and he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. Isaiah 61 talks about bringing good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the broken heart, proclaim liberty to the captives, opening the prison of those who are bound. All right, you see this. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. So what Peter is saying is, Cornelius, you understand the Old Testament. Jesus fulfills the Old Testament. Jesus is Isaiah's Messiah. Jesus is the servant that Isaiah spoke of. This is geared. This is sensitive. This is Israel-sensitive evangelism. Because Cornelius worshipped the God of Israel. Now he mentions Jesus' death. Go to verse 39 of our passage. Acts 10, verse 39. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. And again, that alludes to Deuteronomy 21, verses 22 to 23. You don't have to turn there. Okay, but Deuteronomy 21, 22 to 23, which states, Cursed is the man who hangs on a tree. And it alludes to the fact that a hanged man is cursed by God. And so what Peter wants to share with Cornelius is the manner in which Jesus died. He hung on a tree. He was crucified, reflected his bearing the highest condemnation of the Old Testament law. Deuteronomy 21 to 23 is like uh, 21 verses 22 to 23 contains the equivalent of what you and I would see as the modern day death penalty. It's, it's like that was for murderers. What's the worst curse that God can bear upon a person? What's the worst punishment that could happen to the grossest and the vilest offenders of Israel? They would be hung on a tree. And Jesus is completely innocent. He's sinless. He's the Son of God. And the manner that he dies, he bears the worst reproach. He bears the sin. So he dies in a way that, that would be shameful. And so even his death fulfills the worst punishment. He truly bore the law and the punishment of the law. 
Yes, in his heart, yes, in a spiritual realm, he bore the spiritual wrath of God. But even in his physical manifestation of his death, he bore the worst curse of the Old Testament law. And so this is the gospel for Jews. Now look at verse 40 to 41 of our passage, where Peter, he talks about Jesus' life fulfilling scripture. He talks about Jesus' death fulfilling scripture. Now he talks about Jesus' resurrection, right? And God's, God's, God resurrects his son. Look at verses 40 to 41. But God raised him on the third day and to make him appear. And he didn't appear to all people, but to us, the disciples, who he had been chosen, who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And Peter testifies not only to Jesus' resurrection, but he says, not only did he rise from the dead, but we saw him afterwards. We saw him afterwards. That he would that that uh, that we had breakfast with him. He made fish for us. And so you, you see some of these in the end of John and at the end of Luke, that there are post-resurrection appearances recorded. Then, in verses 42 to 43, we see God's commission. Peter talks about Jesus' life, Jesus' death, Jesus' resurrection, and Jesus commissioned his disciples to preach this truth. It says in verse 42, He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that He is the one appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. To Him, all the prophets bear witness. To everyone who believes in Him, receives forgiveness of sins through His name. The apostles went to preach. The apostles went to preach that Jesus is the judge of the living and the dead. And what that means is that Christ is authoritative, not over not just over one nation of Israel, but over the entire world. He will judge all of mankind. And that's what we see. So what we understand here is that Cornelius is a bridge. Ethnically, he is a Gentile. But Peter is able to preach to him in a way where it makes sense to someone who grew up understanding the Old Testament. When Paul preaches the gospel, he starts with creation later in Acts. And we're not going to get to that passage, but he refers to creation because he, he is going straight up to pagan Gentiles who don't have Old Testament knowledge. Right? So Peter's very strategic about how he does this, but Cornelius is a bridge. He's a God-fearing Gentile. Later in Acts, God turns his heart using Saul and Paul who becomes Paul as his chosen instruments to go after hardcore pagan worshiping Gentiles like me. And that's why I love Paul. Paul is my favorite because he speaks to me. Uh, if you're a bad guy, you like Paul. Okay. Um, point number two. The second truth is that God confirms. So the first is that, is that Cornelius needed to hear the gospel. I'll come back to this in the application. But the second point is that God confirms Gentile salvation. Again, this is not an application point. This is basically what is God doing in this passage? Because that's important. You can't miss that. What is God doing? Why is God sending Peter? Why does God give a Pentecost 2.0, if you will? Right? Look at verses 44 to 48. While Peter was still saying these things. So Peter doesn't get to finish his sermon. I mean, so I wish that that could happen. I wish I could just be like, open your Bibles and read, reading the passage halfway and people are like, I want to get saved, pastor. I want Jesus, but I'm not done yet. Oh, Hanley, you didn't even have to get to that application. I believe, you know, I, I wish that would happen, but this is what happens. Peter's preaching midway through and he's interrupted by the Holy Spirit, which is awesome. You know, you want the Holy Spirit to do this? Okay, but this is what happens. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. So everyone who heard it, the Holy Spirit fell on them. And the believers from among the circumcised, now who's that? Who's that, right? Who, who are the circumcised? These are the Jewish Christians who are with Peter, who had come with Peter, were amazed. And again, Peter was perplexed. We saw that he was inwardly perplexed last time, that God would even want to save the Gentiles. Now, they're amazed that the gift of the Holy Spirit was being poured out, and it says, look at verse 45. I'm reading out of the ESV. But look at how it says, even on the Gentiles. Almost like God wants to save people, even Celtic fans. 
Right? I mean, that's kind of what we're saying. You know, that's kind of what it's like. You know, God wants to save people, even those who cheer for the angels. You know, <laughs> go blue. Okay, but I mean, that's kind of what it's saying. It's this qualifying statement that really I'm amazed that God wants to pour His Spirit and save even the the dirty, pork eating, shrimp gobbling Gentiles. God wants to save them. Can't save them, but but look at the response. And so, one application of stretching. Right? One of the applications of vibrancy is being stretched. Right here, Peter's heart is being stretched and expanded to understand that God's church includes more people who are different from you. Right? And one of the things for us is that we need to expand our hearts if we're going to reach our community. People who are of a different race, different culture, different social economic background, different generation, different language. We need a heart stretch. That's precisely happening here. It's a racial, cultural thing. Right, look at verse 46. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. So if you can understand what they're saying, then these were foreign languages. These are languages like Spanish, like, but I mean, literally, it, it, it was probably Aramaic and Hebrew, languages that the Jews could understand. Right, this is not talking about some angelic uh, tongues from, from 1 Corinthians because those required interpretation, but no interpretation is required here. Look at verse 47. You know, uh, because in 46 it says, how do you know that they're praising God? How do you know they're, they're not just saying gibberish? Because Peter and his, and his, and his friends understood what they were saying. And then in verse 47 it says, can anyone withhold water? I love this. We're Baptists, right? Uh, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people? I know we're in a drought, but God's the one who gives water. So Baptist churches, I know, you know, we use a lot of water. We still need to use water. Save your water for baptisms. Okay, um, so with how, withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So, so you see that, look at that language. Jewish Christians, we've received the Holy Spirit. Now they too have received the Holy Spirit. We're one. We're one. This is new in redemptive history. And then it says in verse 48, and he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain for some days. Now there's a few quick application points here. You should be baptized as soon as your, your salvation is confirmed. If you're not sure if you're saved, if you're saying, I don't know if this Christian life is really for me. I don't know if I'm ready to respond to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I don't know if I'm ready to have my life changed. Then don't get baptized because you're not sure if you're saved yet. If you have questions about your salvation, especially teenagers, I was a youth pastor. I know too many. I, I know too many teenagers and young children who get baptized because their parents told them to, or they get baptized because they got emotional at camp and then they go to college and they're like, yeah, that was just a phase I don't believe anymore. Right? You see that. So that's why I'm, I'm way more confident baptizing adults who have made a decision and and they know. So if you're in that camp where you're like, I'm not sure if this is really my faith or my parents' faith, I don't know, then don't get baptized. But once you're confirmed, how, in this passage, what's the confirmation? The, the Holy Spirit. right? The, that Peter saw that they were received the Holy Spirit. And if you get the Holy Spirit, you cannot not be converted. Right? So as soon as you can confirm through testimony, through conviction, through affirmation from the church and an interview from the pastors, <laughs> once you can be confirmed, you shouldn't wait. You should be baptized in obedience to the commandment of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because that's what happens here. You see that, that they obey, right? And, and, and that's what, that's what Peter says. He says, let's baptize them. Why wait? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And they asked him to remain for some days, meaning they fellowshiped. And that's amazing. It wasn't just like, okay, I'm a Jew, and we know later that Peter still struggles with this whole cultural thing. Okay, we understand that. Later you get to Acts, you read more in Acts, you'll see that. But it's not like Peter's like, you know, um, I don't want to touch you dirty Gentiles, but i got to share the gospel with you, so hold on, let me put on my food-serving gloves. Jesus loves you. I see that all the time. I see that all the time. You know, we, we used to take kids to, to, to uh, on missions to certain places, and, and Pastor Jerry and I talked about it. We're like, hey, it doesn't change their hearts. Let's take them locally and just show them they need to share the gospel. Because they go there and it's like everyone's poor and, 
and, and, and, you know, you don't have showers and, and you don't have your regular food. But as soon as we cross the border or come back, it's like, oh, let's go to McDonald's. You know, let's go to In-N-Out and you go back to your Game Boys and you go back. It's just, it's just temporary. We see this during the homeless ministry. It's like, okay, we can, you know, I, I'm going to put on some gloves, shake some hands. But then afterwards, I go back to my house, I go back to my clean house, and I take a shower right away and, you know, throw my stuff into the laundry. I mean, that's our hearts, right? I mean, Peter doesn't do that. He doesn't go in and say, okay, I'm Jewish, so I'm holy. Here's the gospel, I'm out. Right? It says that they asked him to stay, and he stayed and fellowship with them. Do you think they had a local Jewish market? I don't know, maybe. Did he bring enough sustenance? Probably Peter, I don't know, began to have their hospitality, began to eat the food, began to at least where he could, um, but he really began to accept them slowly, and God eventually changed his heart. So you see that Peter was truly being stretched because God was stretching his redemptive plan and extending salvation to the Gentiles. Here's the summary. I want to give you a summary, and then I want to give you a take-home truth. The take-home truth is more an applicational point. Otherwise, this passage doesn't preach. Okay, you, if But this is what the text is saying. What is God saying in this passage? What God is saying is that Acts 10 marks the turning point in redemptive history where Gentiles receive salvation through Israel's Messiah. Not just some random Messiah, but Israel's Messiah. Now, 99% of you can sit here right now and say, Amen, Pastor! That's great! Okay, that doesn't change your life because it's just a theological point. You're just like, that's nice. God's saving Gentiles, I'm saved too. Bring out that fried chicken, Pastor. Look, bottom line, that's the point of the text. But if you don't apply the text, it's, it's meaningless to you personally. Here's your application. Good and morally upright people need to hear and respond to the gospel. They need to hear the gospel. That's important. Because, again, so first, first application, being a good moral person is not enough to enter into heaven. Cornelius is an example of a morally upright person who was a God-fearer. But apart from coming to Christ, he would still end up in the same place with murderers and thieves. He needed Jesus, and God works, God, good works were not sufficient to save him. He needed a personal relationship with Jesus. Now, why do I say this to, 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 to a church? Because in America, Christianity in many parts can be cultural. And there's a lot of people who are just good moral people. You're good people. You attend church, but are you saved? Maybe. So my question is, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? I'm not asking, do you come to church and serve? I'm not asking, do you put 10% in the, in the offering plate? Thank you very much. You know, I'm, I'm not asking, are, you know, do you, do you feel better because you have, because you come to church and do some things? I'm asking, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus? Because look, Cornelius is a pretty good guy. He's a pretty decent dude, but yet, without hearing the gospel, he's going to hell. And that's why God says, no, you need to hear it. I'm going to send my messenger to share this with you. One third of the Trinity is not good enough, but there's a lot of people in the Bible Belt who go to church and they fear God. They fear a higher being. They fear the Ten Commandments generally. They're patriots too. They love America. It's great. They're conservative in their values. But do they have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Turn to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 21. Spiritual vibrancy becomes here, begins here. You cannot do anything spiritual for God unless you're converted. You can do physical things, but you cannot accomplish spiritual work. And you can't even start becoming spiritually vibrant unless you have the Lord as your personal Lord and Savior. Look at Matthew 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, do many mighty works in your names? I've never casted out a demon. 
You know, so I don't know, but, but, uh, and then it says in verse 23, then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Meaning there's a lot of people who are going to say to Jesus uh, when they meet their maker, Lord, I, and let me give you my version, California version. Okay. HIV. I know what that means, but Hanley International version. Okay. Uh, I'm going to give it to you. But God, I went to youth group. I played steal the bacon. <laughs> I went to rafting trip. I served as a counselor. I was an usher. I was a worship team singer. I, I was a pastor. I taught Sunday school. I, I walked the aisle. I said the prayer. I went to that camp where Pastor Albert preached. I signed up for something. And he's going to say, look, you did all these things, but did you know me as your personal Lord and Savior? So that's why everything starts for us with the impact center. If you went to camp, you will understand that the impact center is where people go to be fed. I, I, I think it's hard because in our church culture, it's like, all right, let's get busy. Let's get busy. Let's do stuff. Let me ask you. You want to serve. How's your marriage? If you serve, you shake someone's hands, you greet someone, you serve, someone sees your life, they see your family. How's your family life? For some of you, spiritual vibrancy doesn't begin, doesn't begin with good works. Because that didn't save Cornelius. It doesn't begin with getting busy. For some of you, it's reconciling relationships. For some of you, it's it's working on where are you with Jesus. Some of you might not even know where you are with Jesus, but you want to get busy working for him. You know, that's cool, but we want you first to become a member. We want you first to go to the impact center, which is where we will train people and move them from seekers to disciples to leaders to mentors. We need to have a study and then serve. And then rotate. You study God's word, you grow, you serve. Then you take a break, you study some more, then you go back and serve. That way people don't just serve, 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 and burn out. At, on, on the other side, people don't just study, 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 get all puffed up, and don't do anything. We need to have a balance. Because good works is not what God is looking for. Good works need to be a product of spiritual conversion. Otherwise, you're going to go to Jesus and say, Jesus, I did all these good works for you. And he'll say, okay, I never knew you. Do you know Jesus personally, as your Lord and Savior. A second application point is that there's a sad reality that it's much easier for bad people to admit that they're bad. Okay, and like I said, I'm, I was a dirty pagan. You did not need to tell me that I had problems. And I love it because when I used to talk to people who are bad, it's easy. Okay, it's not so much that they're going to convert to Jesus, but I can tell them, look, you know, your life is pretty jacked up. And they'll just be like, yeah, it's, it's pretty jacked up, bro, but I'm just keeping it real. You know, whatever. So at least they'll admit it. But but you go to someone who maybe they go to church culturally. Maybe they do all these good things, and you're like, hey, you need Jesus. You're a sinner. And they're like, what? I'm a sinner. I'm not a sinner. I pay my taxes. I vote Republican. That doesn't make you holy. You know, so, so really you got to think about it. Are you sitting here today thinking, I'm a pretty good person morally. I'm a pretty good person. And, and I'm not taking anything away from you. That's good. God was honored by Cornelius, but, he, but Cornelius needed to hear the gospel and he needed to respond to the gospel. And generally speaking, bad people, sometimes they make light of hell, but at least they know they're going to hell. Okay, You'll hear the joke all the time. Uh, these bad people, they make light of God. They're like, I'll see you in hell. I know I'm going to hell. I'll see you in hell, right? They they know that they're going to hell. But when you tell someone who's morally right and morally righteous and they're pretty upright and they think they're a good person and you even bring up the H H E double hockey stick and they're just like, no, no, no. What are you talking about? I'm going to hell. I'm so offended. I'm so offended that you would say that I would go to that place. Because I'm a pretty good person, even without Jesus. If there was a heaven, I don't believe in God, but if there was a heaven and I died, I deserve to go there. Why do you deserve to go there? Because I'm a pretty good person. And this passage today says, not so fast. So I want you to ask, are you here today just as a cultural, traditional, good, moral Christian? Or do you have a vibrant, personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Are you just a Christian Confucius, you know, you just have good moral principles, or is it feel goodism, where you want to do good things because it makes you it makes you feel spiritually good about yourself? 
uh, a belief in a higher moral being. All of these things are good to a certain point, but they will not save you. Second, okay, well, I already gave you a second. So third application, people cannot be saved without hearing and responding to the gospel. And what I mean by that is there's this false idea. There's this false teaching that if you're in a place where a missionary never reaches you, and, and, and you reach out for the closest concept you can of God, that you'll be saved. Okay, there's this false idea that let's just say I'm on an island by myself, and I never hear the gospel. The gospel never reaches me. I don't have a Bible, but I have bananas. And so I'm worshiping the banana God because that's the closest thing possible. And then can I really say to God when I get to heaven, God, you never showed up, but I worship the banana God, and if you did show up, I would have converted to you. This shows us that Cornelius was pretty good, but he needed someone to go and share with him. He needed to hear. Peter needed to open his mouth and speak. So no, people who never hear the gospel... They, they don't get a they don't get a pass. That means missionaries need to go. That means we need to share. That means we cannot assume. God's not going to give a pass to good people just because they believe in a moral higher being. The application is along the same lines, but there's a false teaching taught by some some pastors that, that you may be like, oh, that pastor said it. It might be true. There's some people who actually believe that if a missionary never reaches you, that God's grace will just cover you and you'll be saved. No, no, no. The only way to be saved is to actually confess Jesus Christ as your Lord. And that's why Cornelius wasn't good enough. Do you see? I mean, that's a strong point. One third of the Trinity is not good enough. You would think, at least I got the God part right. I got the Yahweh part right. But that wasn't good enough. You needed the Son of God in your heart. You need a conversion in Jesus Christ. And Cornelius didn't get a break until Jesus saved him. Right? So, so close to saving faith is not saving faith. So beloved, if you need Jesus, please turn to Jesus. Turn to Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. I'll be around after service until the membership class at 1. I want to make an announcement about that. Um, this is our second week of the membership class. Um, you have to attend both to become a member or to be baptized. Um, by now, your testimony should already been written. So if you didn't come to the first one and you're not ready to really get everything done in, in two weeks, which means in two weeks, by September, testimony written, testimony given, interview, voted in, then I would suggest you waiting till next time. Okay, um, and, and we'll work on what we can do to give more frequent baptisms so that you can obey your conscience uh, without having to always wait for our calendar. Uh, but in the meantime, we, it is a process where we work you through and confirm these things. Every member that comes through, we confirm, do you really have a personal relationship with Jesus? That's what the pastoral interview for, is for. Are you just like a cultural Christian? Why are you getting baptized? And I've discouraged young people from getting baptized because I know personally what it's like to to want to believe in Jesus. And then the next day, you know, I, I find high school. I'm like, oh, pretty girls. I don't want Jesus anymore. And God saved me by giving me acne. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your grace and your love. And Lord, you want to save us. And Father, I pray that for each and every one of us in here, including myself, that we would have a vibrant relationship with you first and foremost. That we would live that out in our relationships. And then out of that, Lord, that we would be stretched. That we would study and then apply what we know. And then we would go back and study more and then apply what we know. And that and that a hundred percent of the members of this church would be involved in moving us towards becoming a vibrant church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.